How's everybody doing? Everybody good? Everybody awake? All right. Um, can we maybe uh, get the doors shut on the side, perhaps? Anybody who's near there? All right. Awesome. So uh, how's the conference going for everybody? Good? Enjoying it? All right. Um, my name is Jeremy Grelly, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've been with Springs Force since, you know, 2007, uh, working on all things web uh, when it comes to spring, basically, since, since that time. Um, how many of you came to uh, Chris and Rawson's talk about the, the intro to WebSockets this morning? All right, all right. So um, what I wanted to do with this talk is essentially pick up where they left off. They, they showed you a lot of stuff about kind of the low-level bits of how WebSockets work, uh, kind of some of the, the different libraries you can use, the, the networking concerns you might have with WebSockets. So what I wanted to do with this talk is essentially pick up from there and show you kind of the, the practical approach to how you would actually build an application that, that uses WebSockets and uses it for something you know, more useful than just chat, for example, uh, which is kind of the canonical example you, you always see. I've, I've done probably 100 chat demos myself over the years doing different kind of push-styled things. We're not going to do that this time. Um, so, yeah, yeah, all right. See, uh, so what we are going to do is actually... I want to go through and show you kind of the, the patterns that you can apply on top of WebSockets um, to really create this sort of this, this useful publish-subscribe messaging semantics uh, that you can use in, in, in an application and build it in such a way that it can, can be leveraged as a service uh, and, and made available and where you can even you know, publish messages from an outside provider and things like that. Um, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how this also affects mobile, uh, mostly just because of the, the uh, uh, you know, it's a bit easier to do demos uh, in the browser and, and not have to be showing my phone all the time. I'm mostly going to focus on, on the browser for the demos here that we're going to build. Um, but a lot of these things do apply to mobile, and they work in mobile. But at the end, I'll talk a bit about the, the differences and some of the other additional things you can do on mobile. So... With that, that's, that's almost my last slide. Um, so yeah, let's write some code. Um, so just to get started, uh, oh, I should introduce you um, to my friends. So this is Jurgen and Chris and Mark and Rawson. Um, they, they may you know, bear a, a slight resemblance to some guys on the spring team. I don't know. Um, but uh, they're going to they're gonna help me out today. They're going to be the, the kind of arbiters of my, of my demos. Um, but with that, let's, uh, let's, let's just focus on one of those guys first. Um, we'll, we'll look at Jurgen. He'll help us out. So um, I've got a, a good bit of kind of uh, skeleton code already in place here. So I, I want to walk you through a bit of that first. Um, how many of you have heard of Vertex? All right. So one of the things with WebSocket in particular, um, with any sort of this, this new paradigm of, of using push to deliver messages to the client, where you have clients establishing these long-lived connections, uh, we find that using the traditional uh, servlet type patterns are not necessarily ideal for that and that you want to use something else uh, akin to, you know, this is, this is the reason Node.js is kind of as popular as it is right now because it's very good. It was when it, kind of its original use case was to handle that scenario very well where you have a, something that just has a single threaded event loop that uh, is essentially passing events around your system and most things are non-blocking and, and, but one of the nice things about Vertex versus Node, for example, is that you can still have things using traditional Java libraries that, that may be using older uh, blocking I.O. as well. And so that's what I've actually done in this application. So I'll give you just a, a quick tour of the, the base infrastructure we have here. I've got a, a bootstrap class that's essentially just 
uh, you know, starting up an application context, very simple. Um, and that application context is setting up several things. So as we get more complex in our demo, we're going to be using RabbitMQ and we're going to be using Redis. Um, so you see those, those components being set up. But at the base, just getting started here, what we're really going to just be using is Vertex. I'm using Vertex in this case in the embedded mode, which basically means you can just kind of instantiate Vertex within your application and then run, uh, run code inside the event loop on it uh, within any sort of application. Now, I wouldn't necessarily do, do it this way in production. The Vertex has kind of a, a module system where, which you could just as easily use Spring in to kind of configure components. Um, and you get some advantages from that in terms of keeping the class path simple. But uh, for the demo, I thought the, the simplest way to show you this uh, is just to run it embedded. So you see I've got Vertex, and from Vertex I'm creating a, a basic HTTP server um, and also a SOC.js server, which we'll get to later. But, but that's basically it. This is, this is the extent of my Spring config. Not, not a whole lot going on. Pretty simple. Um, on top of that, uh, some other uh, existing infrastructure that I have that, that we're not going to rebuild here. Um, I've got this session manager. So what you'll see when we, when we get further along, we'll talk about that more in detail. But basically for the notion of sessions, I'm kind of storing things in Redis, uh, which happens to be just a, a very good fit for this, this uh, type of need. And then we'll be using Rabbit as we get into it. So I've got a, a Rabbit service as well. The way that both of these services are implemented is essentially they're designed to pick up messages off an event bus, in this case the, uh, the Vertex event bus, and then, and then process kind of commands based on those messages. So pretty straightforward. Um, just wanted to give you kind of a, a glimpse at those, but mostly we'll be focusing on the push service. So um, also just real quick, we'll look at the client-side code. I've just got one... Um, main module. This is an AMD module that's essentially bootstrapping the application, uh, you know, starting up my, my little characters and, uh, and doing some essential drawing. Uh, the, the images you saw were actually being drawn to Canvas and we'll be doing some, some animations and stuff with that as we go along. Um, but what I don't have in here yet is any sort of communication with the server. So we'll start with that. Um, so just starting, very simple, uh, kind of hello world, so hello world WebSocket, and then we'll go from there into a, a, a much more kind of layered and nuanced uh, push service. Um, but I do want to make that point. The way that we're building this is essentially a, a completely standalone service, right? So you could, uh, in fact, I've deployed versions of this at, at various points to Cloud Foundry as kind of its own thing. You kind of... Uh, this app that's just, you know, pushservice.cloudfoundry.com. And you can connect to that. We've got set up uh, to handle cross-origin and so forth, like Adrian showed in his talk last night. I've got a very similar handler in my application. Um, but the idea here is that we build this service that you can uh, push messages to, and, th and then it will push messages out to any client that's connected to it. Um, so just to start will show uh, kind of how to uh, just do very simple kind of WebSocket connection establishment. So I've got some, some of my bootstrap, further uh, kind of bootstrapping vertex here. I've added in a request handler. Basically, that's going to do uh, simple HTTP matching because we want to do uh, essentially provide a REST API as well as the, uh, the push API so that clients that don't have WebSocket or don't have SOC.js can still push messages to our service and they'll get sent out to connected clients. So I've got handling for HTTP and then I'm, I'm registering a WebSocket handler. So we go to that WebSocket handler, there's, there's nothing there yet. It's actually, it's, it's pretty simple what you have to do. So that handle method that gets invoked here, this will get handled the first time, uh, basically any time a, a WebSocket client connects to our server. So just to have some, some debugging as we go along, we'll uh, put a little bit of printing in here, WebSocket connected. All right, so once you have uh, an established socket, then you need to be able to handle the actual, uh, any, any incoming data on that WebSocket, right? Uh, it, 
and in this case, we'll just do we'll just do a very simple kind of echo uh, from the client to the server. So we'll do socket uh, dot data handler. I hesitated to to actually do this example in Java because without closures, it's <laughs> a little bit more verbose. Um, but why not? So let's see, we've got an event coming in, um, and we'll do, we'll turn that into just a, we're, we're just going to send strings back and forth, so message equals event dot, two strings. So the, the, the data comes in as, what the, this buffer that you see is a vertex buffer, it's just kind of the, the kind of, thing that you'll see throughout any vertex handler that's doing network I.O. Uh, it's essentially just a convenience class for doing encoding and decoding um, and, and kind of shoveling those things around the system. So, but it'll automatically in the two string, it'll take that, that incoming data from the client and, and decode it properly using uh, UTF-8 encoding by default. Um, so then when we get our message, we want to then just, in this case, we're just going to echo it back to the client, right? So. Uh, we'll take our socket and we'll write a text frame. Um, so as you probably saw in the, the uh, talk this morning, WebSocket has a few different frame types that you can actually send back and forth. Uh, there's text. There is also a, a binary frame type, but we'll just keep it simple and, and do text here. Um, so we'll do echo with our message. Um, all right, and then while we're at it, we'll go ahead and put in a uh, a handler that basically will handle any time uh, one of these clients disconnects, just to show uh, how that, how that happens. Um, socket dot end handler new handler and we're just going to log that. So very simple. Yeah. And then we'll get to the code for the, the client, the corresponding side. Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead. I've got a, just a really simple, because I've just got everything in a main method, I'm just, I, I have a simple uh, setup here to, to start my application. Um, from Eclipse directly here so we can, you know, see the console and everything. So there we go, our server's running. Let's uh, create this corresponding code on the client. So here we want to do ver uh, socket equals a new web socket. And we just put in the, the address to, that we're talking to. And that will that'll establish the connection. As soon as the this, this scripts get loaded, that will actually establish uh, a WebSocket connection. And then we want to say socket uh, on open. Add a handler for that. And then we'll, we'll just log that we've, uh, we've connected. And we'll also go ahead at that point, once we have the open socket, we'll send our message to the server. And then receiving the, the return message from the server is just as simple. So we have another handler. Mm, that's a good point. I actually uh, did this wrong, I think. There we go. All 
Okay, same thing here. So we get a, a basically we're just getting a text event um, from the server. So I have some uh, some helper methods to actually when we get messages to actually uh, uh, kind of display them. So we've got a, a help uh, a method to to make Jurgen uh, say what he received. So do event dot data. That's okay. All right. So it looks pretty good here. Let's go ahead and uh, see if it worked. <laughs> so we've got our server running. We'll reload Jurgen. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh, I didn't do dot log, did I? All right, so you can see it, it's actually pretty quick. It, we got the we sent the the data to the server, got a response back almost as fast as we could as we could render it to the canvas and actually show this. So so that's you know that's WebSocket at, at, at its most basic level how it works. The thing is that's you know that's all it does. It sends it's a it's basically a pipe that sends data back and forth for actually you know doing a, a more complex and, and useful communication within an application, you typically want to do a bit more than that. The other problem uh, with WebSocket is that right now in today's world, uh, it's not going to be available everywhere. There, there are various problems. There are, you know, for one thing, you, if you're supporting uh, IE, even IE9 didn't have it yet. I, IE10 finally does. Um, also, network topologies have uh, problems with WebSocket where a lot of existing uh, proxies and things like that will actually not handle WebSocket connections very well. Uh, and in fact, Cloud Foundry itself, uh, WebSockets right now don't, don't work on Cloud Foundry. So we need another solution to kind of be able to do this same thing, use WebSockets when we can, when they're available, um, but also uh, be able to work with older browsers and older network top topologies as well. And that's where SockJS comes in. So SockJS is a library that was written uh, by some guys on the Rabbit team that essentially mimic the WebSocket API, uh, the same very, same very simple API, but it will actually fall back to other transports when necessary, uh, such as uh, long polling or streaming or things that, that will work in cases where uh, WebSocket is not actually available. So we can... The first thing I would do when building this service is actually use SockJS instead of using WebSocket uh, instead. The, uh, but then on top of that, what we actually want to have are more messaging style semantics. Instead of just text going back and forth over the wire, we want to actually have uh, you know, pub-sub type semantics uh, in the application, which would make this a, a good bit more useful, where you could say uh, subscribe to particular topics from the client, uh, send JSON messages to it, have it routed to other people, uh, have messages that, that other people send routed to the client as it's connected, things like that. So we want these higher level semantics on top of this uh, lower level library. So that's what we're gonna what we're gonna actually start uh, building here. So we'll start with actually converting um, from using WebSocket to actually using SockJS first, and that's that's pretty straightforward. So I'll remove this guy and go to this one instead. So basically, the main difference is um, so one difference, one one pretty major difference between SockJS and WebSocket. Uh, is the recommendation with SockJS is to only keep one connection open in the browser in, in, in any given session at a time. The main reason for that ha has to do with uh, limitations to how many connections you can have open because it actually uses two HTTP connections to do outgoing and inbound in, in certain scenarios. That's basically why that limitation is there. Um, WebSocket does actually allow you to, to establish multiple connections within a, a, a single page, 
Um, I'm not actually sure that's, a, that's that useful. Most patterns I've seen and, and most use I've seen of WebSocket, um, you generally only need to have one connection unless you're doing really, really high volume streaming of data. Uh, and in this case, that's, that's not so much our intention. So as a result of that, because it has to also work over HTTP, one thing you do need to do with uh, SOC.js is give kind of a prefix, basically a URL that it can hook onto for the cases where it's not using uh, WebSocket especially, and have that live alongside your, your just general HTTP uh, handling for the application. So we can get rid of this one entirely and just focus on the SOC.js handler instead. Um, and this one's equally straightforward. I've got some other stuff in here that we'll, we'll ignore for now. This is more once we get to building the higher level protocol. Um, but essentially we're going to do about the same thing that we did before. We'll take the incoming message and just echo it back. So that in itself is very simple, right? And same thing on the end, we'll just log that. Overall, it looks, you know, even on the server side, it looks very similar to how the WebSocket API looked, right? Um, and on the client side, it's, it's nearly the same thing. We have, instead of new WebSocket, we say new SOCJS, change this to HTTP. And what SOCJS will do is it'll actually, uh, for a given, a given connection, it'll actually choose the best protocol to use. Uh, it'll try to use WebSocket first because that's, that's generally going to be the, it's still going to be the best one out of all these other alternatives if it can use it. It tries WebSocket first. If it can't use WebSocket, then it has uh, essentially ways of going down the list of other uh, protocols like long polling, streaming, and it has a, a, a way of selecting which one is the best in a certain scenario. And it'll do that transparently. Um, in this particular case, because I'm not on a, a limited network, I'm doing everything over localhost, this will actually end up still selecting WebSocket for the communication. Other than that, the uh, code for this is almost identical to before. Let me just, uh, yeah. So here we'll say hello SOCJS instead. And you see the, the API, all I did is changing just to SOCJS, the, the API is otherwise the exact same on the client, and that's very intentional. As opposed to uh, some of these other libraries that you, you've seen emerge in the last couple of years, like socket.io is probably the, the other major one that comes to mind for me. Uh, it's the other very popular one in the node world, um, where socket.io kind of bakes in all of these, these other semantics from the start on top of WebSocket. Socket.js is just literally trying to, to give you the WebSocket API in places where you can't use WebSocket. Um, so it's, it's, it's essentially exactly the same as the WebSocket API beyond the, the initial establishment of the connection. So with that, let me restart our server since we changed that. Why is it showing me that? Hmm. All right. 
All right, so same thing. Hello, SockJS. So we're, we're good to go. So now we can start actually building on top of SockJS some actual uh, kind of our own micro protocol that would be useful in applications. So what we want to have, um, what, what especially client-side JavaScript developers are very used to already, is the notion of topic-based pub-sub messaging semantics, right? This is something that's been around in JavaScript libraries for a while as a way of just doing uh, eventing within the browser, a, a, a loosely coupled way of doing eventing. So it's been in Dojo, it's been in jQuery. It's something that's very well understood in, in JavaScript land. So I think one of the goals for building a service like this and building a client API on top of it is to have something that's very similar to that, uh, but that happens to actually work across the wire and actually talk to the server as well. So that's goal number one. Um, goal number two is, is we need to actually um, have a bit more rigor on the server side about actually tracking clients because we're going to be opening resources on their behalf. So every time a client connects, what we're going to do instead of just sending data back uh, directly over the WebSocket connections only on this one client, we want something that can actually scale uh, to where we can easily ramp up multiple instances of this same uh, app and still have it scale across those. So a really easy way to do that is to hook up uh, rabbit.js, uh, I'm sorry, rabbitmq, as, uh, as the messaging transport. Instead of trying to, to rebuild those things from scratch ourselves, why not actually use these things we have readily available? Uh, so that's where Rabbit comes in. And then for session management, you know, we want to be able to actually, because we're opening those resources on the client's behalf, we want to be able to track sessions and know when they go away and know which resources we need to actually clean up uh, when a client goes away, it disconnects. So when a client disconnects from the browser, we want to you know, clean up all of the, whatever resources they've established in, in our SockJS uh, message broker, I mean SOC, RabbitMQ uh, broker. So, so that's the first thing, is to actually uh, build some semantics for how we actually do a little handshake in our protocol. So the protocol I'm, I'm going to build here is actually going to be designed so that we don't ever actually send anything through the, the WebSocket or SockJS connection except for kind of very much protocol level things, like this initial handshake. The reason for that is so that we can still publish messages from other places. You, you know, you could be publishing messages from another completely separate server-side app of some sort, you know, something built with Spring integration, anything like that. So we want to, that's another requirement, I think, in, in the service. So, so we want to be able to, to track these things and establish that connection over over the SockJS tunnel, but then that's it. We aren't going to use it on the sending side from the browser anymore from there. Um, the only way we're going to use it then is, is sending from the server to the browser. Anytime we receive messages off of Rabbit, we'll then publish those to the client. So that's, that's kind of the, the protocol I have in mind to actually build up here. Um, so in this case, I'm going to Go ahead and, uh, so I showed you earlier, we have uh, this session manager. So it's already doing some of this work uh, for the notion of sessions. And it's, what it's going to do is when we create uh, a session, it's going to store it in Redis, which is already connected. And that, uh, that infrastructure is already there. So instead of just doing uh, a simple string, now we're going to talk JSON. So JSON these days, you know, it's, it's not turtles all the way down anymore. It's definitely JSON all the way down. So that's what we're going to be doing. JSON is, is kind of the easy way to do all this uh, cross-process communication between things. So, so as soon as this payload comes in, this, this um, initial handshake comes in from the client, we're just going to parse that. Um, it's, it doesn't even have to be anything uh, complex. It can just be a simple kind of empty JSON payload to, for the client to kind of say, hey, I'm here. Um, and then we're going to establish a session and then return some data about that session to the client so the client can track that and know uh, kind of what, he's, uh, what his identity is. And what we'll do is we'll actually establish um, 
some, some initial bindings in Rabbit uh, on behalf of that client. So we want to be able to do uh, two different kinds of, of publishing of messages. We want to be able to do kind of broadcast messages where uh, essentially a message gets sent and it, it, it goes, it's, it's essentially intended to go out to anybody who's actually connected to our app at a given time. We also want to be able to do specific topic-based publishing. And that could be uh, a topic that is established dynamically. So you could have topics that are you know, essentially intended only for one user, that the, the user establishes himself. Or you could have topics that you know, are kind of a group of users. We can get, you can get very fine-grained in the way you do this just by using the, the semantics that already exist in RabbitMQ. Um, so we'll go ahead and we, we've got our JSON payload, so we'll go um, and we'll put an event on the Vertex event bus. So like I said, the way that we are communicating between our different services within Vertex is using this event bus. Um, so it's pretty simple to send a message. Uh, we've got, so our particular session manager has a, a number of different addresses that it's listening on already. So I've made those available just in, in uh, some constants here. So we'll create a session and we'll send that uh, JSON payload along with it. Now, what you can do here in Vertex when you, when you use this, this, uh, this mechanism is actually you can reply to the message. So we have request response style messaging. So the handler, once it handles it, creates the session, it's actually going to, I'll show you that handler, it's actually going to just reply to that message. So you can actually establish a, uh, a listener for that reply as well within the, the same call here. So we'll do handler Probably need a new there. That'll work. Let me get back on the screen here. I have one too many. Yep. All right. So the event comes back, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, what the so basically, the, the session manager is creating this session in Vertex. Um, it's then kind of encoding that data into uh, a JSON object. So we've got kind of a session ID, and we've also got some, some initial bindings that we'll establish with Rabbit. We'll establish a binding to uh, a broadcast queue and also to, um, to a connection to be able to kind of get connection notifications and things like that. And we'll also, uh, by default, what we're going to be establishing is just a, an actual queue for that particular session. So that any messages, if you're able to get the session ID of a particular user, uh, you could actually directly send that user a message um, if you actually utilize that in the application. So, so we've got that event coming back. And basically, all we want to do is, is send that um, Back to the client, essentially. And I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat a little bit here for this particular case. Because we've actually got a little bit more to do here, and I'll I'll talk about that in a second. Right, so we're doing a little bit more. We're actually putting the session in there. Um, we're storing the session into just a, a, a local variable so that we can associate uh, a given socket with a given session, right? So we're storing that locally to this class. Let's see. Oh, did I? All right, thanks. Yes, I did. Look at that. So 
So we're not just, so we're sending the, the initial, creating the session, we're doing that in Redis, we get that back, um, we get the ID, we store that, and then we send that uh, basically back to the client. We also register a handler here, uh, just another Vertex event handler, uh, for the given session ID, so that later on, whenever we get messages for an intended recipient, uh, an, an intended session, we can actually send those back from our, our Rabbit service, and then they'll get propagated back out to the client. And then the, the socket write buffer is actually what's taking our, our message and sending that back out. Don't have. Okay. We also want to uh, do a little cleanup. When the socket gets closed. And I'll leave that one out for now. So we aren't actually doing anything with Rabbit just yet. Um, but when the session when the session gets closed, when the when the connection gets closed by the by the browser, we want to actually then take that session information and remove that from Redis. So we're cleaning up those resources after that user. Right, okay. And I'll go ahead and cheat a little more since I'm getting a little closer on time here. And we'll write the, the uh, essentially the initial handshake code on the client. Oops. So basically here we're doing very similar to what we're doing before, but um, so we're establishing the, the SOC.js connection um, on open. We're basically just sending this little handshake, right? And that'll uh, essentially establish our session with the, with the server. And then when we get a message back, um, the first message we get back, we know if we don't already have a session established, we can take that, that initial message back and say, okay, that's our, that's our session response and, and kind of store that for the duration. Um, any other message that comes back, we're going to expect to be a command uh, for our character, basically. So, and and we'll, we'll parse that and handle that. So that's, a, that's basic session establishment. The other thing we want to do whenever they establish a session is set up these, uh, these rabbit bindings as well. So let me go ahead and, and do that as well. And I'm going to do that within the same workflow as where we actually establish the session um, after we've, we've essentially uh, stored that in Redis, then we're going to set up uh, these queues on behalf of the user, the behalf of this particular SOC.js connection. We're going to go ahead and set those up. So that's what this uh, create and subscribe event that we're sending to the Rabbit service is going to do. Um, it's sending the, the session and the Rabbit service then will know what to do um, to actually create the right bindings because uh, we actually have that as a, uh, the bindings are, the initial bindings we store in that same session information so we can track those things. Um, so one of the things you see when we create a new session, we actually put some initial bindings in there, this broadcast binding, this connection binding. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and create those in Rabbit initially as soon as the user connects and basically establishes uh, their, their presence in our protocol. 
And then once that's done, we'll finally write something back out to the client, basically just uh, a, a kind of OK message, kind of completing the handshake so that you know, you've established the, these resources on the user's behalf, the, the client is waiting for a response, it gets this back, it says, OK, now I can start using the API. Now I can start doing the, the additional things beyond just uh, listening for messages as well. <clears throat> And also now I can expect messages to come in. So we'll do one more tweak to, well, let's just go ahead and start that up and I can show that to you. All right. Let's see if anything explodes. It looks like we're good. So we got, so now we're connecting, uh, we're establishing that SOCJS connection. We get, uh, you know, that connection is open. Rabbit resources are created on our behalf. So you should see in the queues now, I've actually got um, a queue corresponding to that particular session. Um, that queue has the, the, the broadcast binding and the connection binding that, that we talked about um, already connected to it. And, and we get the session uh, handshake message back from the server. So now um, what we want to be able to do is, is actually to send messages so that this user can receive them. Now, like I said, what I, what I want to be able to do in this service is actually have that done purely over HTTP. So you can send messages um, from anywhere. It doesn't have to be directly to uh, over the WebSocket connection so that a, a, any kind of client, be it a server-side client or a, a browser-based client, if they don't have WebSockets or SockJS for that matter, they can still publish messages to this system. So to do that, we'll just set up a, a pretty simple um, HTTP handler. So this matcher is very, it, it's kind of a, I would, I would call it a bit of a crude version of what you can do uh, in, with, with uh, Spring MVC controllers. It's just very similar, you know, matching on a, a REST style URL. Um, again, this is one of those things, if I were building a bigger application, I'd look to kind of build uh, a higher level thing on top of that, but, but because we're doing something pretty simple, this is fine. I've actually done some experiments with running Spring MVC on top of Vertex, and it, it does work, but that's for another day. Um, so for now, we're just going to use Vertex's built-in thing here. Uh, so essentially, when we get a message published to a given topic, and this is going to be a JSON message, we'll take that and parse it, parse out the JSON. We'll uh, kind of add some additional uh, information to it, right, the, the, the topic and then the, the body of the message. And, and then we're going to actually publish that to Rabbit. So basically, anybody can send a message to any, uh, essentially, any binding that exists, any, any topic that exists in our system. So, you know, once, so for example, the, the broadcast binding that we're already establishing uh, by default for a given user, we can then send a message to that broadcast binding. It'll get sent out to basically any connected user uh, as a result of this incoming HTTP request. Right? So, again, very simple. Just, just in decoding the JSON, adding some additional information to it, sending it back out. So, now that we've got the ability to push these messages back out to the user, um, we can actually add a little bit more uh, uh, code to handle that. Looks like I lost it. <laughs> there we go. That's not it either. 
actually, we have enough code to handle that. I take that back. For, for this particular case, we've got enough. So let me go ahead and uh, restart my server again, and then we'll, we'll see if we can send some messages to Jurgen. Isn't it nice how fast Spring starts up when you don't have Hibernate involved? I'm just saying. <laughs> um, all right, so we're good to go here. All right, so he's got a session. He's listening. So we can actually use um, the REST shell that, that uh, Adrian was showing, for example, in, in his demos last night. And hopefully, uh, if everything's good, this will work. Look at that. So sending over HTTP to, uh, to our service, we're just posting a message, and then that's putting that message onto Rabbit. We've got a listener already established on that user's behalf, so that message is getting pulled off of Rabbit and then sent out to that uh, SOC.js connection. Right? And it's all pretty quick. Now, of course, this is all over localhost, but you know, it's pretty nice. Um, so you can see how we can start to then layer additional functionality on top of that. Yes? Here, let's do this. So all these guys should be connected now, right? So I've got all these sessions. Try and get out of the way. Here we go. Right, so, so this is our broadcast binding. So this goes out to basically any, any connections we have established. Just one message. Because we're actually sending the message again to the service, to the, the REST service basically. And, and that's getting you know, put on Rabbit and then sent over the SOCJS connection. So it's just one message getting routed through the system basically. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from there, we want to do. We want the clients to actually be able to uh, kind of create their own subscriptions to uh, you know basically to to create topics on the fly, so that you can uh, different uh, clients in the application can subscribe to different things that are more say say use case related or something like that. In this case, we're just going to keep it simple, but what I do want to at least be able to do is for each one of these individual, uh, individual characters to be able to subscribe to a topic that's basically just uh, you know, a place that they can get messages only destined for them. Right? So essentially kind of point-to-point -point semantics, um, but just by, by the nature of that you only have one person subscribing to this topic. Yes? One of the clients is slow uh, in the way that, uh, well, it, it wouldn't get to that point until uh, it, it would get to the SOCJS handler. So the message would be pulled off the rabbit queue. It would get to the point of writing back to the, the browser client. Um, you can do some things, some additional things within the Vertex API to actually, uh, there's, there's like a pump method, for example, that you can actually check whether the right queue is full or whether the, the you know, client's not essentially getting data fast enough. And, and you can actually do some things to control that within Vertex. Um, yes? Right, right, right. Absolutely. And Again, this is a, a pretty simple scenario, but because you're doing this, you know, because of doing this over HTTP, you could certainly apply, you know, the same sort of security handlers that, that you use anywhere else. So um, we actually, when we were building something like this uh, earlier in the year, we, one of the things we were going to do was like uh, apply OAuth based on security on top of it. And you could do that pretty easily because most of the API is, is HTTP based. Um, you could do some additional things with, with SOCJS to actually intercept the incoming connections as well and maybe make sure there were some credentials in there. 
um, things like that. So you could certainly apply security on top of this. Um, I'm not doing it in this, this particular, particular case. Yeah. So, so now we want to be able to, to create subscriptions, subscribe to you know, different topics uh, that the client desires to, to kind of have open. Um, so I'll go ahead and just running a little closer to my time here. So I'm going to, again, cheat massively especially because this is uh, the, the more complex one, I think, of, of all the ones I have. Now here you see the, the kind of <laughs> the, the drawback to uh, callback-based programming in action. <laughs> uh, it can get a little hairy. And this is, you know, as much a, a factor in Vertex as is in Node. Now, I could have broken some of these things up into separate classes, but I got lazy at this point. Um, so let me walk through what, what, what we're doing here. So we're going to allow the clients to post to subscriptions and with a, with a binding key for, for Rabbit, basically a, a routing key. So the topic that we... Uh, the the exchange that we have set up is, is a topic exchange. One of the, the nice things about the topic exchange, you can actually use like uh, wildcard identifiers and things like that. So you could even do things like um, post a key where, say like Jurgen.star, and then other people could send things that were more uh, specific to certain use cases. Say like uh, the, one of the apps I built before was like an expenses app, and so you could have like Jurgen.expenses, Jurgen.inbox, stuff like that. Um, so it's pretty nice, the, the flexibility that you get by, by hooking up to, to Rabbit in that way. Um, so essentially, we're just going to take the binding key from the URL here and, and essentially create that binding in Rabbit on this user's behalf. Um, so what, what most of this code is doing, we're actually, first we're going to get the session, because remember our session is actually tracking um, all of the subscriptions and all of our current bindings for a given user. So first we've got to retrieve the session from Redis. We're going to update that session with the new binding. Right? So we're going through, iterating through that and adding it. And then we send it back to our session manager to, to then save that session again in Redis before we do anything. Um, then we actually establish the binding within RabbitMQ, and that's pretty straightforward. We just send this, um, this bind message with the information for uh, what we're actually connecting to, what, what uh, routing we actually want to establish, and, and then we're done. That's basically it. So, uh, you know, a bit of code to just do a, a couple things, but now we have the ability to actually uh, create new topics on the fly uh, from our browser-based API or, uh, well, yeah, for, for anybody who's connected uh, over SockJS, and new topics that if then some third party knows about the topics or, you know, essentially what you've baked into your application, um, you know, some third party uh, service could also publish messages to those, but also the client themselves can publish messages to those, um, and they'll get routed appropriately. So... Let's add a little bit of code there for the client. So what we're going to do is now, um, as soon as we get our session established, I'm going to go ahead and post to that new, uh, that new API, that subscriptions API, and establish a subscription to, in this case, we're just going to subscribe to the given character's name so that we have individual topics set up for each one of our, our separate characters now. Um, so pretty straightforward. This is using a, a, a really, nice, uh, really nice library that Scott Andrews wrote, actually, uh, for doing RESTful calls uh, from within the browser. Uh, you know, basically... Over Ajax, you know, it's very similar to kind of some of the, the jQuery things that you may have used before, but it has, it's also got some characteristics of REST template where it can actually knows how to do proper content negotiation and things like that. Um, 
So we're going to do that to actually establish our, our new subscription. So let me again restart this guy. Let me try it with Jurgen first. There we go. So we should have the ability now to send messages to individual users. So if I do base URI, let's do this. All right, so, and same thing, if I open up, now if I go back to all four of my characters, let me make sure. Okay, I think they're all connected. Oops, I just lost them. <laughs> Give it just a second to make sure. Yeah, should be good. And again, do the same thing. You can see the message just gets sent to Jurgen. Now, you know, and then I can do similar things like uh, I can send something to Chris. And same thing, you see, so we now have these, these pretty useful kind of uh, publish subscribe semantics within the application. Um, we can also do, this, different type of command. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so actually, I think I I lost something here. I was supposed to have. Uh, we'll we'll get we'll get that when I uh, show you the next step. They're actually supposed to respond to that, <laughs> but uh, I'll do that when I. So so now we've got you know these basic semantics set up. The one thing that's that's kind of missing here is um, doing all of this you know, with SOC.js directly and with the, the kind of client directly, we should be able to pretty easily abstract that out into a, a nicer uh, client-side API. Basically one where you can, uh, when you do subscribe to a topic, make sure that, um, you know, you can establish different JavaScript handlers for responses coming from separate topics. So you don't have to be doing everything within the one SOC.js on message uh, kind of thing. So that's, that's not too tough to do now that we have this whole thing established. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch over to that uh, version of the application real quick. Let's see. Oops. All right. So now we've got, and I've got this whole additional client that I've we've we've written up. I won't bother go through going through the whole thing. The the code in that client is essentially based on what you've seen, um, but the API now that's uh, facing the user. It's more like this. We've got these, this messenger uh, service that we're connecting to. 
and actually has subscribe uh, method on that service. So we can actually uh, establish a subscription and then we can assign a separate message handler to that, that particular subscription. In this case, I'm just doing the same message handler for both um, specific subscriptions like that as well as my, my broadcast subscriptions and uh, essentially all of my fallback subscriptions. Um, but I've got this pretty decent, nice API now, which is much more uh, akin to what most JavaScript developers are going to be used to, where the, it's, you've just got these basic public sub, publish subscribe semantics where when you subscribe to a topic, you assign a handler uh, to actually handle any messages coming from that topic. Um, and don't, didn't really change the uh, server any for that. I'm just perhaps just a little bit to add some additional kind of session tracking semantics on top of that, I think is all I did. But, um, you know, but really just built that API up on top of this protocol that we now have established. So I'm going to restart my server one more time. like we have our sessions established. Let's see if we can do this again. I know Chris is actually sitting there. Maybe it's unkind that I'm killing him. I don't know. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you can see, you know, WebSockets by itself doesn't, doesn't, you know, it's pretty raw, right? You don't get a lot. But it's pretty easy with these existing tools to build up a, a kind of your own application-specific protocol on top of that and run this as a separate service. You know, one of the reasons I, I recommend doing it this way even um, is because the, the semantics of how you scale uh, WebSockets in this sort of communication are just simply different from how you want to scale the rest of your uh, your application, like say say the rest of your application is just a you know a standard kind of REST API uh, with with your application level semantics, the 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 reasons for kind of scaling that out and, and creating more instances of your your REST API versus this part the, this push service are essentially going to be different. So being able to actually create these these smaller uh, loosely coupled services like this and deploy them somewhere, um, you know, like Cloud Foundry, like, like some of the things that, that Adrian showed you last night, um, was really effective and, and really actually the way that, that I recommend going about this if, you, if you're going to do this sort of thing where you have this uh, type of thing where you want to do push messaging with either the you know, browser-based clients or even with mobile clients, the, the, the requirements for scaling those things are simply different than the requirements for scaling out your, your you know, basic REST API type of stuff. So being able to keep this separate is, is actually really useful. Um, so I do want to uh, just touch on mobile a little bit um, before I conclude. So the thing about mobile, you can certainly do this. You can use this API in, in a mobile application, in one that you know, whether it be a mobile web app or, uh, or maybe a phone gap app uh, that's actually in a native shell but is using JavaScript and using HTML. So you could certainly take this service we've built and just use this same JavaScript API in, in that manner. Um, but you have to be very careful. Uh, you, you have to be, when you're doing mobile clients, the one thing you really have to watch is battery usage. That's the one thing, the top thing uh, that, that's been cited as the reason that a person will uninstall an application is because it hogs their battery, right? So in mobile, you have to be careful about how much you're keeping the, uh, the cell radio on, for example, if you're, if you're on the cell network or the, the Wi-Fi radio, not, not quite as bad, um, but especially the cell network and, and especially... Uh, if you're on something like 4G LTE, that can really suck down the battery um, if you try and keep the uh, connection active uh, even when the app goes to sleep, for example. So uh, now, 
from what I've seen, and I, I need, we, this is something that needs, I, in my opinion, needs a bit more research and kind of established, um, you know, data about it. But at least from my, my kind of practical experience, what I've seen experimenting with mobile phones, they are pretty good at when you have a, a mobile web app or you have a phone gap app, uh, when the WebSocket is not actually in use, they're actually pretty good about uh, not keeping the radio active. Like they've, uh, the way that mobile networks work, it'll actually, when there's no data coming across, it'll actually stay relatively asleep. But it is still powered on, it is still using battery. Um, so what you might be tempted to do is, say in a PhoneGap app, for example, you can, uh, well, certainly in Android, it's a little harder on iOS, in Android, you can do things to, um, when an app goes to sleep, you can kind of keep certain things active. Um, and the one thing I would say is refrain from doing that as much as possible because that's the thing that's going to end up killing the battery the most is, is uh, if you don't treat things the right way when the app has gone to sleep. And this is what uh, all of the mobile providers, uh, in particular iOS and Android, this is why they've established these native push notification systems. Um, so native push notifications are, are quite a bit different in that they're, they're somewhat limited, for one thing, in terms of what you can send in them. I know the, the I believe the last time I looked at the Android API, uh, you're limited to something like four kilobytes uh, payload data that you can actually send in a message. So you're, you, know, you don't necessarily want to use that as a replacement for the, the WebSocket side of things uh, for this sort of publish subscribe thing. What you can do um, is use the push notifications to, you know, if you have a message for somebody and you know they're not connected, like you've seen that their socket has disconnected, we could add some additional things to the service to, to track those things if we know they're a mobile client, for example. And if you get a message off the rabbit queue and you know that there's, there's no longer a SOC.js connection corresponding to that message, you could uh, actually use native push notifications, send that to the device, have that you know, correlated some, somehow in your application. Um, you know, and, and in that case, when the user wakes up the device to essentially handle the notification by your app, you can then reestablish uh, you know, there's several ways to go about it, but you could reestablish the SOC.js connection or you could just use HTTP to essentially uh, go back and pick up the message that was waiting. And this is what we call the, the claim check pattern. Um, and, and I think this is actually something that, that Spring Integration would be quite good at. Uh, they they kind of have these things already baked in. Um, so that's, you know, when you're, when you're on mobile, that's just the one thing I, I have to say is be mindful of that. Um, and take advantage of these, these native systems that are out there uh, that, are, that are specifically designed for this use case to where you need to notify the user um, that you have some data for them or whatever, but maybe they're not going to claim it right away. You know, maybe they're just going to claim it whenever they next kind of open up the app. But it does also have the ability to, to notify them that, hey, you have something waiting for you, just like when you get incoming email messages and so forth on your device. Um, so definitely native push notifications can be used pretty effectively in combination with this stuff uh, in that way to, to, to still uh, use these patterns but also use them judiciously to where you're, you're not being a bad citizen uh, for your, your mobile users. So uh, one thing I, I do have to kind of recommend and point out um, is Urban Airship. Urban Airship takes these native push notification systems and kind of normalizes them so you get basically one API in terms of how you publish messages. And, and then it has, it basically takes care of doing the implementation of the native systems. Um, so Apple's, for example, their push notification system has a completely proprietary uh, protocol that is published and you can implement it, but it's, it's just a TCP protocol. It's, it's not even over HTTP. So you have to, if you were to do this yourself, you would actually have to implement that protocol or find some library that's implemented it. Um, and then there's all these, you know, different kind of scaling things you would have to keep in mind with that. Um, so Urban Airship keeps you from having to do that. It's a pretty, pretty good, pretty popular service, certainly with mobile developers uh, that I've seen. And we do have this, this hasn't had an official release yet, but I do have to point out um, 
Craig Wallace actually wrote this uh, earlier this year. We have complete bindings now for urban airship, very similar to, say, the other spring social bindings, other, other bindings we have for other, like, uh, basically existing HTTP services like this. We do have the code uh, for bindings to urban airship, and it is kind of lives in Spring Mobile. We just haven't uh, released it yet. But it is there, it's tested, and it works, at least as, as far as we know. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's about it. So just in summary, I want to say, you know, SockJS gets you uh, basically thinking in WebSockets now, right? So you, you've seen WebSockets, you know it's, there are potentially uh, limitations to how you can use it to... Uh, in your particular scenario. So definitely SockJS is a thing that can get you there now in more cases, in, in more browser versions, uh, more network topologies, things like that. So definitely check it out. Um, you know, if, and the nice thing about it mirroring the WebSockets API is you know, eventually browsers and network infrastructure is going to catch up. So if you use something that, that essentially uh, mimics the, so the WebSocket API, then you'll be in very good shape for when you can just use WebSocket all the time. Um, so as we've seen, you know, I think practical use of WebSocket requires these kind of additional patterns on top of it, these you know, application-specific protocols to really make effective use of it. Um, you know, and, and as I talked about, you know, ideally you do this as a separate service because of the scaling requirements. And ideally, you, you take advantage of these existing tools that you have available, all this existing you know, spring infrastructure for, that, that I use for accessing Redis and Rabbit, and, and just uh, use those existing things you have available and just bridge those in uh, to, to establish this kind of system where you have these very different semantics from request response, but, but can pretty quickly get up and running uh, establishing this sort of system and doing it in a, a way that's useful to your, your client-side developers. Um, so yeah, so with that, uh, thank you very much, first of all, everybody, for coming. And I've got uh, a good 15 minutes, at least, for questions if anybody has them. Yes? Uh, so the question was why I didn't why didn't I use the AMQP mod with Vertex? It was a combination of things. I wanted to to use Spring stuff with it. Um, also, I think when I looked at the mod, it didn't do quite what I needed it to do. Yeah, it you can't. I, I don't believe you can create the bindings on the fly like that. So Spring AMQP gave me the API I needed to be able to uh, you know dynamically on the fly actually create these these bindings. Uh, within the application. So that, that was the main reason. Oh, uh, it's just in my GitHub account. Um, my, my GitHub ID is at the beginning of the, of the, the slides. It's JeremyG484. Um, I'll, I'll post that on Twitter later as well. Um, but yeah, the, the finished application is all in there. I don't think I've pushed up all the intermediary branches yet, but it, it's in there now. Anybody else? Yes? Yes, so the question is whether you can have different clients with different protocols using SockJS at the same time. And absolutely, yes. SockJS kind of just normalizes that uh, by, you know, it tracks each connection separately and it knows whether one connection is WebSocket or one is HTTP streaming, anything like that. So yes, if you had an older browser within your system, it would still work even if you had other browsers that could use uh, WebSockets as well. Um, yes? Um, so, Yes, I would say SockJS is, is production ready. I know, you know there are some people using it uh, fairly heavily in production. They're using, mostly that I know of, they're using the Node version. Um, but the, the, as far as I've seen, you know, Tim has done a really good job of keeping up with them uh, and, and implementing the same things. I think he might actually be slightly behind in the Vertex version. 
uh, compared to the latest Node version. But uh, other than that, as far as I've seen, he's done a really good job of just making sure he just tracks their changes very closely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, some examples of other libraries using SockJS, for, uh, if you've seen Meteor.js, for example, they're actually using SockJS under the hood for their whole thing, uh, their, their live web apps kind of thing that you, if you came to Scott's talk yesterday, you guys may have seen. All right, I think that's it. So thank you again, everybody, for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.